Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth Motor City Manmouth. I'll introduce the crew real quick. Willie Epting has a couple minutes to go, hopefully, and we'll be he'll be able to get his question on his segment. Uh, the crew, obviously, is Eric Katz, Jordan Long, George Eichhorn, Willie Epting, and, yes, Warren Brewster will come as advertised tonight. All right, Willie, we're going to be talking about the 1980 Philadelphia Phillies. Go ahead and ask Mr. Brewster what's on your mind. And while you do that, also – I'll find out whether or not you think Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. All right, Willie, the floor is yours. Hey, Warren, man. Thank you for coming on with us. I appreciate it. I'm honored to talk to you. Um, Thank you, Willie. I appreciate yes, sir. it. I am a huge, huge baseball fan. It is the first uh, – it's the it's my first love. And uh, I've had a love-hate relationship with baseball over the years like most people. Uh, we've, right. been on, we've been on the verge of divorce many times, but uh, here we are. <laughs> Um, I actually want to ask you a question about the late bite of blue. Um, yeah. he, you know, he passed away last week right. or a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't know if you would in the age of, uh, when you played, there wasn't any, of course, interleague baseball, but no. was there at any point where you guys had, you, you ever, ever had to go against any of his teams? Yes. He was with the San Francisco giants, uh, in 1978. And then I uh, grew up, I grew up here in the Bay area. I live in Napa. Uh, where I grew up, and Vida loved to come to Napa and play golf. I played in a number of golf tournaments with Vida, and he became a very good friend, wonderful man. Just, I did baseball clinics with him, and it just the kids just absolutely adored him. He had kids in his lap constantly, and just was a just a superhuman being. You know, it's it's a big loss for baseball, and the, the, the and all all the baseball and the uh, Oakland A's organization, the Giants organization, Kansas City, all the teams that he played for. It's funny that you mentioned that because uh, him and my dad were were close. We lived in uh, we grew up where well, I grew up the first part of my life in Oakland. And mm-hmm. uh, right. that's where my love for that city and that's that that team comes from. Um, and when you talk about the kids, I was telling the story on my show a little earlier today, how I remember we were at his house when he lived in Alameda. And uh, my sister and I, my older sister and I, we were actually playing on the beach while him and my dad were in the house talking and doing whatever <laughs> it is that they were doing. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I do recall him being just a, a tremendous man yes. and uh, very, very, very fun to be around, too. Right. Right. Always had a smile on his face. Always had, having a great time. Just never had a bad day. Just a beautiful human being. Got anything else, Adam? You want to talk about the 1980s team real quickly, Willie? I know, and Pete Rose real fast. Well, not necessarily Pete Rose because that that's that that story is is going to continue to be what it is until it's not. Right. Okay. But for me, I mean, you were on the staff with a lot of great pitchers there. You know, Bystrom and of course Steve Carlton, and then right. you know the the guys out there with Manny Trio and and here's here's my favorite name of all time. And I want you to just tell one story that you can tell about this this guy. What was Bake McBride like in the clubhouse? That is my favorite <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> he was he was quite a character. He 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 was uh, oh what would you say? He was very uh, uh, he he was always up to something. You know he had he had to keep one eye on Bake because he never knew what was going to happen. He was great. He was great to be around. He was a lot of fun to be around. And he was he we got him in a trade in the middle of 1977. And he really made our team go. He really made the offense go. He gave us somebody that could steal bases and put really put pressure on the defense. He was an outstanding uh, player and a great human being, another great guy to just be around. And he was inducted to the Philadelphia Philly Wall of Fame last summer. Uh, We finally had our reunion last August. Uh, for the 1980 team, our 40-year reunion uh, due to COVID. Of course, obviously, we couldn't attend, uh, or and no one could attend. And uh, then Bake, was, Bake and Ron Reed were both put on the Wall of Fame, Very both the very deserving individuals to be on the Wall of Fame and recognized by the Philadelphia Philly organization. Awesome. One last question for me. And uh, I remember this gentleman, the way he could, the way he could rake and the amount of power that he had and that's uh, Greg Luzinski. 
Um, <laughs> was he really as big in person as he was on TV? My yes. God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, he would, you know, he'd walk through the Krebs house and his son was about three or four years old at the time would walk together and they both have the same body type. I mean, he was a huge human being and it's, his little boy had the same big, huge legs and he was a tremendous talent. He just, yes. he had absolutely launched balls in the, at the bat and hit a lot of tape measure home runs. He was fun to watch. He, uh, Tommy Underwood got traded from us for Bake McBride in 77 and Tommy came back the first time and Bull hit two balls off of him up into the upper deck. It was just two bull blasts. He really, he hit the ball a long way. In fact, in Houston, he hit a ball that almost hit the back of the of the Astrodome wall. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he hit some mammoth home runs. Unbelievable. Well, Scooter, that's all I got, man. I got to get out of here. Hey, you know what? You did a lot in five minutes, man. I'll tell you what. Uh, Willie... You cease to amaze me. And tonight was one of your better acts. It was a short, but one of your better acts. Okay, Willie, before you leave, let everybody know how they get a hold of you real fast, okay? Uh, let's see. On Twitter, at Shakeback Media Group, that's S-H-K-M-E-D. -E no, no, it's Shakeback. It's S-H-K-B-K-M-E-D-I-A-G-R-P-B-K. -E um, on Twitter, also on uh, YouTube, at Shakeback Media Group. And uh, yeah, I got all kind of shows going around. So our our website is where you can check me out, shakebackgroup.com. Yeah, and I met Willie through Twitter. So you know what? You can meet great people everywhere. <laughs> and with all due respect, Eric and Willie Epting are a product of Twitter. Thank you very much. All right, Willie, thanks for hanging in there with us. Glad you got a few in. And you and I have a lot more. I'll see you the next time in two weeks on this very show, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. All right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Y'all take care. Thanks a lot, Willie. Appreciate you very much, my friend. Bye-bye. Take care. Now there are five. Okay, well, you know what? You want to talk about rapid fire, George, as a far <laughs> time as what we had last night. Yeah. All right, Warren, you know what? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions now. Sure. Let's talk about Mike Schmidt. Yes. Some yeah. Favorite story Argue Arguably the greatest third baseman to ever play the game. You know, just uh, struggled one year, hit 196, and only hit about 20 home runs, and then all of a sudden figured it out. And uh, he claims a lot of it. He claims to Pete Rose. He uh, Even when Pete played with Cincinnati, they went out to dinner or something, and uh, Pete just told him, have fun. Just have fun during the game. And that's what, you know, I just – I always had a great time. It was just – it was where I like to be between the white lines. It was always – you had to have a smile on your face, and you're out there having fun and playing a kid's game. So, uh, you know, he finally realized it and quit putting so much pressure on himself and then ended up having a Hall of Fame career. Well, you led into the next one very well. I'll tell you, if I was doing play-by-play, -play, you, you'd definitely be hired as my color commentator. Warren. Good. <laughs> my friend. All right. Thank you. Let's talk about Pete, okay? Yes. And I, it, this will be a two-part question. Item number one, okay? Do you think he should be in the Hall of Fame despite everything that he's done with gambling? Uh, without question. You know, he, he, he was the greatest hitter. He's the all-time hit king. So, you know, to me, when I see Roger Clemens, seven Cy Youngs, Barry Bonds, the all-time home run leader, Pete, the all-time hit leader, and all three of them are not in the Hall of Fame, there's something wrong with baseball. You know, that's just my personal opinion. They, well, they should be recognized for what they did on the field, not between the white lines and not what they did off of it. All right. So the second part of that question, will he get in there post when he when he's dead? I I would think so. I think sooner or later, you know, when he if he pass when he passes away, yeah, the, I think the Veterans Committee will recognize, you know, what a great player he was and and the uh things off the field that he that that he was involved in uh will be a thing of the past and they'll be buried with him yeah well i mean the guy living it i mean he's not helping his cause every time he goes to <laughs> right. an autograph signing right, right down the road right I mean, you know pete you know you've done very little to make any friends well you know i'm gonna <laughs> sign autographs put money in my pocket while this is going on right I mean, right I mean, you could pick 50 other weeks to do it and and then anger any commissioner that's been in sight to me seriously you know it's, i don't know he's not helping his cause i mean I, I like pete rose and and having been to cooperstown a few times his artifacts are all over cooperstown right so you know the only thing that isn't in there is the plaque <laughs> yeah, is him yeah that's it yeah all right so <laughs> let's go ahead and look back on your career and your journey to the big leagues all right 
<laughs> well, so I, I st- go ahead. I started in Napa, California at Napa High, and I had a very good high school baseball coach, uh, Clarence Ty, and uh, Bill Buckner was two years ahead of me. So there was always a lot of scouts around when we were playing. And uh, Bill was one of the greatest contact hitters, uh, doubles hitter to ever play the game. Uh, and then I went from there. I played one year at Napa Valley College, where I presently coach. I've been doing that for on and off for 30 years. Uh, and then I went to Fresno State for two years. I got drafted twice by the Giants, and I got to know the scouts in the area, and I asked them, who's the best pitching coach in Northern California or in California? And they all told me the same thing was Bob Bennett. So I called, I got on the phone, I called him, told him who I was. And he said, give me a couple of days to find out who you are and come down on Saturday and throw for me. So I went down and threw for him on the side. We toured the school and, and, uh, he I threw on the side for him and he said, uh, he offered me a scholarship after the throwing session. And, uh, then I told him, you know, I don't care if I ever pitch for you. Just teach me how to pitch. And he did that in the two years I was with him. He and, and then we would see each other every once in a while. And we would stop and just talk pitching for a half hour. You know, I, I, it was a pleasure, just a joy to spend time with him. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but we did uh, have a, a reunion. And we all got together and he came to it. He had um, uh, multiple sclerosis or or dementia, some, I, something, you know, that he was, had, didn't have long to live, but he made it that day. And, and I got to spend 10, 15 minutes with him. And it was a, a wonderful time. He was a great man, great coach. One, I believe 1500 games at the Div- division one level was an outstanding coach. And, and just, uh, you know, I, he taught me how to pitch and I went out in the minor leagues and applied it every fifth day, what he taught me. So describe the 1980. 1980- Phillies championship team. What was it like to be on that team? I believe Dallas Green was the manager, if I right. recall. Right, right, right. Dallas so, took over at the end of uh, 1979 when they fired Danny Ozark. And uh, the Phillies were on a run. They they won the division in 76. My rookie year, 77 and 78, we won the division. Uh, had a tough year in 79, had a lot of injuries, and then put everything back together in 80. And the pleasure, the, the enjoyment I had in the 80 team was when I was on my rookie year in 77, the only rookies were Randy Lurch and myself. Uh, Jerry Martin was a rookie a couple of years prior to that. And we were the only young kids on the team. It was a real veteran team. And now the 80 team with all the injuries in 79, they started bringing up the, the uh, kids out of the minor leagues that I'd played with that Dallas developed as a farm director in the minor leagues. So he was very familiar with what we had in the minor leagues. And um, to, to my opinion, he knew how to run the, the pitching staff. So that's, to me, that's where uh, the difference between Danny and, and Dallas, where Dallas was the next pitcher and ran the pitching staff. Uh, and that's how we won. I mean, that's it, that's what it takes. The years prior when we lost to the Dodgers and they lost to Cincinnati, their pitching staffs were better than ours. You know, so we were fortunate uh, in 1980. We uh, put everything together and it was a knockdown drag out series with Houston for the five games going extra innings. And then uh, finally getting to a World Series after uh, three frustrating playoff series. Uh, and it was like everybody relaxed. We relaxed and just had fun and went back to playing, no pressure, and just went out and played the way we we're capable of playing. And, and we're fortunate enough to win the World Series. Well, you talk about a vet- veteran laden team. Do you feel that there was a bigger bond because you guys were really on the back end of your careers, Nolan? And then you, the, you reach the pinnacle a bit by being able to capture that title. Right, right. You know, it, it was something that was very fortunate. You know, it, it's, we finally got over the hump to uh, get to the World Series. You know, and like I said, it was that was relaxation, just play baseball and have fun. And the, the media was just it was unbelievable how many people were there and just everything was uh, under a microscope. And it was fun uh, being being in that situation. I enjoyed every minute of it. It was a lot of fun. So I I remember everybody knows Steve Carlton never talked to the media so what was it like being around his locker that nobody was around? He wouldn't have no problem with it. You know? Oh yeah. He, uh, he was very personable, you know, I mean, to his teammates, he, he loved all of us and we all loved him and he was our leader, you know? So, uh, I learned, I learned a lot from him. Everybody did. He, he was a very knowledgeable person, very smart, very articulate. 
uh, and it was fun to be around. You know, it just uh, you just had to be in the right place at the right time. I'll never forget. I have one story, and then I want to get to to our information here that I was at Jack Russell Stadium over in Clearwater, and Von Hayes when he came to town, he got a rude awakening, didn't he? You know, he was <laughs> yes. involved with a multiplayer deal. Right. Uh, yeah, five for one. <laughs> yeah, five for one. And I heard a fan from Jack Russell Stadium. If you guys cover spring training, it's one thing. Five for one. And then they, some interesting comment there. And I decided, you know what? I want to write a story on this guy. Yeah. So I walk up to Vaughn, and he was so great. He, he mm-hmm. actually embraced me in there knowing he was traded for five players that they thought he was that good. So. <laughs> right, right. Did I I went up and started talking to him. I, I played against him Go ahead. Uh, when in the off season or the, uh, in, in before we went to spring training, when I was in the minor leagues, I was still living at home with my parents in the off season. And we went around and played the colleges. Uh, we played Cal, we played Stanford, we played Santa Clara and Vaughn was going to St. Mary's at the time. And I pitched against him and he, he tells me I got a base hit off you though. Yeah, obviously I don't remember him from them, but when he got traded to the Phillies, in that five for one deal, I, I, you know, I went to him and, and, and pulled him aside and said, Hey, you know, don't put any pressure on yourself. This is a great town to play in. You play hard. That's all they care about. You play hard, give it everything you got. You'll be loved here. You know, and he had a lot of pressure on him and I said, just relax, have fun. You know, you're here for a reason and just yeah. uh, have fun playing the game. Yeah. When I, and I asked him for the interview, he was absolutely fantastic. So, mm-hmm. all right. Yeah. So let me point out that the audio version of 108 stitches baseball talk can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. So please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a thousand subscribers. Philadelphians are going out here and listening and watching the show. I may be bringing this guy on a lot. He knows a whole lot. So Philadelphians, get on board with us. So I have a few loyal people in Philadelphia that I'm really great for. They're, they're great people. Show, show me the brotherly love and subscribe. Yeah. All right. So with that said, please also comment, like, share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? Send topic ideas at Southward Tribune at gmail.com. Or if you participate in the chat room, that's another way to get on here with us too. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, call me at 954-304-4941. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And this is the second show, and I'm getting worse and more energy to buy sleep. Yeah, but hello, Eric Katz. Okay, you have any questions for Mr. Brewster? I do. So, you know, you were on the team that the Phillies' very first World Series team. They had won two pennants previously and have been coming up short since then. Describe what the city was like when the Phillies finally won it all. Oh, well, it was the craziest thing after the, the day out. The next morning we got up and had a parade, and they estimate that there was over a million people there. We came down Ben Franklin Parkway to Broad Street to uh, JFK, the old football stadium on the other side of the vet, and it was just pandemonium. It was crazy. People everywhere, you know, and that was uh, as far as playing baseball, you love playing a game, but the most fun was the parade, you know, to see everybody, you know, they were all handing us beers and we drank beer the whole way on the float. So we just had a great time. It was all sorts of fun. You know, it was, the, and the people of Philadelphia, you know, it was, uh, we probably finally brought them home a baseball championship. Yep. So, um, you know, I, you were there with um, Danny Ozark, which the Phillies right. had. The Phillies eventually, the Phillies fired him toward the end of uh, 1979. And they right. bring in Dallas, Dallas Green, two couldn't be more polar opposites of each other. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Yes. How was the adjustment <laughs> going from a guy like Danny Ozark, who everybody loved, which, which would you say he's player's coach? Right, right. Um, you, go, you go to arguably a guy who could have been the general in Dallas Green. Right, right. Yeah, what was the adjustment it, like? Well, for me, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't any, it's no adjustment. I came every day ready to play, and, and all I wanted to do was get the opportunity to play, and I was happy as could be when I got to play. So, you know, I worked my tail off. I, I had to work hard to get there, and, and you have to work harder even to stay there. And, and I, I had some injury issues in 79 and, and part of 80, and I finally got healthy, so I was just happy to be there playing, you know. And, and Dallas and I had our 
we had our battles between us and, and you know he i think he really respected me because i stood up for myself when i had my injuries and and uh, said i could pitch if i you know if, if it's not here then it's somewhere else but all i'm trying to do is get myself healthy and be able to help you and i was finally fortunate enough i i did i was able to pitch half the season that year and uh, I was in the fourth game of the playoffs in the ninth inning. He brought me in in a situation that I wasn't accustomed to him. And, and um, I got away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walked the first guy. They sacrificed him to second. And Terry Poole comes up. And I'm going, I've never got him out. And he lines a base hit to center field, ties the game. Loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. The Astrodome was just erupting. And then Enos Cabell comes up and... I throw a strike one to him, and then they pull a hit and run. And I jam him, and he hits a little fly ball to Bake McBride in right field. And Terry Poole is around second at shortstop, and I come down off the mound, and he runs by me. He didn't retrace his steps or anything, and I just ran and got behind Pete to make sure that ball didn't get in the dugout because it's going to be a double play. And it was a double play. We got out of the inning. Uh, we scored in the top of the tenth, and then Tug shut him out in the bottom of the tenth, and uh, we won. So I got a win. I it blew a save, but I got a win, and we stayed. We went to Game Five, and that's where Marty faced uh, Nolan Ryan, and Nolan Ryan taking a three-run lead into the eighth inning was 105 and two lifetime, <laughs> and we pulled it out. We and we ended up. Uh, I couldn't believe they took him out. And then when they did, uh, we ended up scoring five runs that inning, going up seven to five. They came back and tied it, and we finally won it in the tenth inning. Yeah, I was going to say Nolan Ryan's the only guy who one run one run is enough. <laughs> Oh yes, he oh, he was what a phenomenal talent he was. I I was I had the great fortune of getting to hit off, off him one time. And well, Alan Ashby was the catcher and I hit him on the shin guards with my bat and said, I'm just gonna stand here and listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna embarrass myself. It's speak, speaking of um speaking of Tug, you you know, you were you obviously shared the bullpen with him where Tug yes. Tug, Tug was the closer. You know, can, yes. can you describe what Tug was like as as a person? We all know he was obviously a great closer. Right, right. He was hilarious. He was he was great to be around. He was he was real fun. He was he loved to have a great time. You know, and and uh, we always had a good time together. And he was uh, very very interesting, very articulate. You know, always if you had a problem or you needed an answer to something, you always go ask Tug, and he always had an answer. He'd come with something real quick. He just, he was fun to be around. He was a, he was a great person. Okay. I think that, that will, I'll, I'll rest my case there and, ha and have, right. um, and have the, and have the other guys um, <laughs> ask their questions. All right. All right. Well, yeah. Tug McGraw, to me, here's a guy that played with the Mets and then with the Phillies. So he certainly knew I-95 pretty well, didn't he? Yes. But yes. Everybody knows if you're going from Philadelphia <laughs> to New York. It isn't that far of a drive. I've actually taken that drive when I was on my way back from Cooperstown, West City. So, yeah, it's a shame that he passed away early. All right, we're going to yes. go over to him long. So, obviously, you, you as a pitcher, who's the toughest batter you've ever faced in your MLB career? Uh, the one hitter I couldn't get out the most was uh, Keith Hernandez. And there's another one that should be in the Hall of Fame. You know, he was the best, by far the best defensive first baseman. It, uh in the National League, when I played, the uh, first base was basically a DH position. All the first basemen in the league couldn't throw. Keith was the one that could throw, and, and he fielded his position as good. He won, I don't know, 10 gold gloves or something ridiculous, eight gold gloves. He was outstanding, and he was a line drive hitter. And I, whatever I threw up there, he hit a line drive. It didn't matter what I threw up there. He was uh, he was on everything I threw. And we'd played against each other uh, – when we were, he was in high school and I was in junior college. Uh, I played when I got drafted by the Giants. I played in a team down in the Bay Area on the weekends in the fall of 1971. And his father was a Cardinal scout or a, a bird dog for the uh, for the Cardinals. And his brother, I believe, Gary played for the Cardinals a little bit to their system. And uh, he was still in high school. And I can remember I couldn't get him out then either. <laughs> so things never changed. So then my final question is obviously. You know, baseball has new rule changes, but besides that, how has baseball actually changed since you played the game? 
Well, it's, you know, it's the biggest thing is bat flips and stuff like that. Hitters going crazy you know, and, and stuff like that, which, you know, I, I've kind of gotten used to it. But you, uh, it, the one thing we always said was you act like you've done it before. You know, it's, it, you do, you, you know, like Mike Schmidt, I couldn't imagine Mike Schmidt bat flipping 50 times a year. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. I can understand it in, in a big game or something like that in a playoff game or a world series game. That's something that hit a big home run, but to do it every day for six months is it's a little bit ludicrous, I think, you know, and, and the guys adjusting their batting gloves and all that stuff. And, and I understand what they're trying to do is, is get a pitcher out of his rhythm because if they're having a hard time with him, the one thing you've got to do to, to, change things is to get a pitcher out of his rhythm you know but i i believe i i like the pitch clock i'm glad to see him make him work go because i mean you're not getting we're not getting paid by the hour and the people are you know it's you're, you're yeah i the for me it was less time to think i got the ball saw the sign and went i just you know i don't want to think about do, should i do this or i do that I, if i started thinking i was in trouble that's all the questions i have thank you warren <laughs> all right jordan yeah. All right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to carry on for Jordan in just a moment before I turn it over to George. Okay, you address the pitch clock. I love your analogy that we're not getting paid by the hour. That's right. <laughs> I heard that, but that's really good. All right, but let's take it a little step further than where Jordan did. Great questions, by the way, Jordan, really. Thank you. So larger bases, like them or not? I, you know, I, it's, it wouldn't, to me, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. You know, if it's easier for the guys to run the bases and, and because of taller, higher bases, the guys were slipping on them, especially in, in, you know, it rains a lot in the uh, Midwest and the East coast. It's not so much. I, well, I guess you do with the, in San Diego and LA you do and San Francisco, you do have the in, uh, influx of uh, at night where the, the overcast and the clouds come in and the fog rolls in. So you do have some of that, but those bases get slipped and guys fall and twist their ankles and you hate somebody to see somebody get hurt running the bases. You know, I think it, 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 and I like to see them stealing bases again. It's, that was part of the game, moving runners and they're getting back to playing baseball the way it was played and the way it was, it was designed to be played. Execution. You know, that, I coach junior college baseball, and that's all I every day. It's all I talk about. The team that executes is going to win games. So you've got to work on your execution and be able to, to produce, and then we'll send you on to a four-year college. Mound, let's talk about the mound visits. They only allow three. You like that or not? Well, I the one's time, I don't think if a catcher gets crossed up by the pitcher and the pitcher's having a hard time, you know, getting the signals, I don't see how they do, but sometimes they get crossed up. And if that if that's the case, I can see a mound visit from the catcher or the pitcher. And then there's times where it seems like uh, every time they send up a pinch hitter now, the catcher comes out and they discuss how they're going to attack the guy because they've gone over before before the game and talked about how they're going to face the everyday nine now. Uh, so they've got those guys what their what their plan of attack is with those guys. So now when a pinch hitter comes up. I think the catcher should be, be come out to the pitcher and, and be able to talk to him for a second, you know, and just get get situated how they're going to pitch to the guy and, and then go from there. You know, it does it does take some time, but you know, it, with the pitch clock and everything, there's uh, the game's moving along quick. They've cut almost a half hour, twenty five minutes to a half hour off each game now, and and it's I think a lot more enjoyable for the fans. And I mean, bottom line. <laughs> No matter how much you have fun playing the game, we still got to have fans to uh, produce the game, you know, and that's that's what it's all about. Is the fans are are a big part of the game, and you got to make it enjoyable for them. I think a lot of them got turned off. You don't want to go spend three three and a half hours at the ballpark when you can do it in two and a half. All right, so that's a great segue to the Ghost Runner. You like it or you don't? I you know I <laughs> I I don't you know really. Bottom line, they they. It's you've got to win the game. I understand what they're trying to do. They don't want to play 15, 16 innings anymore. I understand that. And they're trying to save pitchers. But I pitched in a pitching staff. We used 11 pitchers one year, the entire season. And we didn't, I've never, I, I, that I can remember, I never played on a team where we had to bring in a, a position player to pitch. You know, if I was pitching to give me the ball, I'll pitch. I pitched three or four. I pitched three in the third innings one day and came back and threw three and two thirds the next day. It, I could throw every day, you know, so, and that's and it's a mindset, you know, and I, I think they've gotten away from that with the contracts the way they are today is I, I 
I'm making five million dollars a year. I'll pitch a couple times a week, you know, and you, I can do that for 15 years. You know, it's it's. I think that has a lot to do with the the mindsets, you know, because I coached in the Philly organization for six years, and Dallas was back in the organization as a mentor and uh, liaison and for the general manager, and Dallas said teach these kids to pitch complete games you know they should be want i mean i pitched in the minor leagues in double a my last year in the minor full year in the minor leagues i had 27 starts and i had 19 complete games i threw 199 and two-thirds innings so i went nine i got to play every fifth day i'm go- i want to play the whole game i don't want to give the ball to somebody in the seventh inning and have them blow my game i that's my responsibility that was my mentality, and that's what I the way I was taught in the minor leagues. Okay, well, let's talk about banning the shifts. You like right. it? Do you like that or not? I, you know, I do because I mean, it wasn't fair for a left-handed hitter, you know, to to sway and put everybody on the right side of the infield and everything. Yeah, yeah I, I do. You know, I mean, it, it gives them a fair chance, just like a right-handed hitter. You know, it's I, you know, the more I see it, the better I like it because I, you know, I watch baseball every day and, and you see line drives it. Whoa, last year, that would have been right at somebody, you know, now their line drives up the middle. It's, it's a lot more fair for, for everybody involved. Okay. Three batter minimum. Uh, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of, I like that better than, you know, there were a lot of left-handed pitchers, uh, to, in my time, a Paul Ossenmacher, uh, ended up pitching seven or eight years at the end of his career where he'd come in and face one guy a day, you know, could pitch every day, but just face one guy. You want to, you know, have a chance to make him face some right-handers. Cause I, as a right-hander, I had to face left-handers and get them out. I had to figure out how to do that. You know, so it should be the same way. You know, and they get him out of there after one or two hitters, and that would be it. But that was the way the game was played. You know, it was structured that way, and I, I like it better now. To, the guy's got to be out there and face a few hitters and, and be able to get multiple people out, not just one hitter out. Well, the only thing I'll say to this before I turn over to George Eichhorn, three better minimum, I can handle that one because back in the day, relievers used to pitch two or three innings. So three right, batters. Right. Yeah, that, that was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. there's one rule that doesn't make a, that I could care less about. And remember though, Warren, when I cover the Marlins down here in South Florida, I'm seeing everything from the press box. So I wouldn't know if the bases look like a pizza box or anything <laughs> lower than that when right. you're way up in the sky. Right. right George, right. I mean, you really notice these larger bases, George, when you're up, there, no. I don't. I mean, I I don't even I don't. see the pitch clock because I'm in the third level at the press box. But <laughs> all I, the only timing device I know is when I showed up there and when I left, and the rest of it is called the ignorance factor. And I like the ignorance factor because I don't have to stay any longer than I have to. All right, George Icorn have been patiently waiting, so the patience is going to be rewarded. Go ahead, George. Well. Uh, Warren, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the ball players of today not appreciating, not having a, a good knowledge of uh, some of the past stars in the league. I'm going to take you back to an era called the Wiz Kids in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. Yes. And uh, the reason we have a connection here in Detroit is because one of those kids, Bob Miller, was okay. the longtime University of Detroit uh, baseball coach here. Oh wow! And did a terrific yeah. job for a number mm-hmm. of years, and and Bob was, he was so proud of what he and Robin Roberts and the rest of those guys did. Right. Did you have any uh, talk or any appreciation of that? Uh, oh, that yeah. year at Philly's oh, era. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, Andy Semenek, the catcher, was yeah. a catching instructor when I when I was coaching in the minor leagues. I coached in the my, Philly's minor leagues from 1999 to 2004. And Andy was there. I used to get a ride from him to the ballpark. We stayed in the same hotel and I'd get a ride wow. with him in the morning. And then Robin Roberts, I uh, coached uh, five years. I did extended spring training and Robin lived in Tampa and his son uh, was one of the coaches on our staff. And Robin was there. He would come oh, at least once a week and he would come in after the game was over. We'd sit down and have a beer and just talk baseball. You know, he was so fun to be around. I just, I loved him. He was what a superhuman being. He was so much fun. And he knew every pitcher in our organization. 
He talked wow. about the kids in Double A. Whoever you you mentioned a name, and he could tell you the all the facts about him. He really stayed in the organization and was was a real supporter of the organization and was uh, you know because it's hot and it's tough and we have long days down there and it was he was a fre- he was a breath of fresh air to talk to in the <laughs> afternoon it was it was fun to hear the stories he would tell it was just it was great to be around Robin and yeah. Andy too Andy was Andy was he was a piece of work he was hilarious he was really a funny man and then Granny Hamner uh, Ruben Amaro Bobby Wine all the guys in the '60s, they were there uh, as coaches when when I was playing, coming up through the system. Larry Rojas, um, geez, I can't. Uh, Bob Tiefenauer, all oh, there was a lot of them. Billy Wilson, there were all the coaches were were players in the '60s, and I, you know, I pride myself on knowing the knowing baseball and and growing up, uh, you know, watching Willie Mays and Willie McCovey and Orlando Cepeda and Juan Marichal and Gaylord Perry. Fortunate to oh. get get to play against Gaylord and I got to face Willie McCovey one time. That was a huge thrill, you yeah. know, a great thrill to face, to get to face Willie McCovey. Absolutely. And you know, the, uh, one of the other things I wanted to follow up with you on is uh, the contribution that the Phillies made to that Detroit Tigers, 1984 championship. His name is <laughs> right. Willie Hernandez. Right. Yes. I played with Willie how, in the minor how, leagues. How Bill LaJoy and Jim Campbell got their hands on Willie Hernandez and obviously, as you guys know, yeah. he not only won the Cy Young, but the AL MVP right, that year. Right, exactly. And did you did you know much about Willie or Guermo, as he's called? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I played with him in Spartanburg my rookie year, oh, my, my first year in pro ball. I played with him half a season. Yeah, so I knew Willie from way back. And then I played with him. He was briefly with us with the Cubs. They traded him to the Phillies the first week or second week of April uh, in 1983. So I, I, we ran yeah. across each other all the time. Yeah, Willie, he, he was what a character he was. He oh, came, yeah. he had a big afro when uh, <laughs> we played in Spartanburg, and he died at white, absolutely snow white, the last day of the season. Yeah, he was, he was quite a character. <laughs> what about uh, uh, Tony Taylor? Was Tony Taylor? Oh, uh, I mean, he was, he was the greatest. He was the greatest person of I all. Loved oh him. My God. Yeah, yes. here in Detroit, they, he wasn't here that long, but boy, everybody yeah. loved him. Right. Yeah. TT. We. He was our first base coach when I played in Venezuela in Maracaibo, and the owner had a 15 square mile ranch, and we went out for a, a barbecue one day, and he had horses, and all of a sudden here comes Tony pulling up on the horse and, and he looked like rawhide. I mean, it's just, I, I, Oh boy. I've never seen a man so happy in all my life. He was just having the best fun. Oh, he was having a great time riding horses all around the ranch. He was oh, what yeah. a great person. And, and, you know, he was always very, very, uh, really pulled for you and just gave, gave you nothing but positive feedback every time he was what great a great man. man. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Warren, for sharing these with me. Oh, and the, oh and you're the welcome, food. George. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. I enjoy. I enjoy being able to spread my knowledge and a few things that I know <laughs> about baseball. Yeah. Well, each and every one of you guys did a great job. Now I got <laughs> follows because of Eric, Gordon, and George. So you get me again there, Warren. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> I got to tell you, when I worked for the Gastonia Rangers, though, I went over to that Spartanburg Park, mm-hmm. and I know full well that Spartanburg. Phillies were there for a long time. Yes, so they were. The relationship mm-hmm. came to an end, but yeah. there are a lot of great Phillies that yeah. came out of there. So with that said, you know, I loved your analogy on the bat flip, okay? <laughs> and the one guy that comes to my mind is Barry Sanders, who used to hand the ball to the official and went back and used to score it. And you, the mm-hmm. way you described it, my first thought process was Barry Sanders hands the ball and the bat flips are stupid. I mean, yeah, they were right. right? Right. I, I personally don't like them. So have you ever considered being a manager? Uh, no, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy I, When I was coaching in the minor leagues, I found my niche was uh, the pitching coach at the uh, New York Penn level or the rookie league where the older right. kids that came in from colleges, from the three- and four-year colleges, uh, came in. And what I did with them, because they obviously they got there with their fastball. Now they need a breaking ball, and we'd sharpen up. You know, and this is stuff that I learned from Steve Carlton about a slider. So if the kids threw sliders, I would I was able to sharpen it up and give them some knowledge on um, sliders that Steve Carlton taught us. You know, so it was things that I could hand, hand pass on that I'd learned from 
a Hall of Famer. So it was, you know, it's very easy knowledge. And then the kids would just fly through the system if they could get it, if they could figure it out. Uh, and then they had a breaking ball. Now that's what we were told in the minor leagues. If you have one pitch that you can throw for a strike at any time, you got a chance of pitching in the big leagues. If you got two that you could throw for a strike at any time, you got a chance of staying. Wow, that's pretty good analogy. It really is. We talk about mm-hmm. the complete game pretty much being taken out of baseball. That's a right. shame, too. Because right, it is. Right. But, and the kid, and you see the kid in, in Alcantara in, in yeah. with the Marlins. He, yeah. he had more than all the rest of the National League combined. And he's that's a true. And, he, and, you know, he's a heck of a pitcher. I love yes. watching Sandy. Yes, I do, too. He's but the great, thing about complete games that people have to understand, which I don't think they're bad, is if you're – getting you're on five days rest or every five days there's every reason why you should have as many or a lot of them because you take the pressure off your bullpen and you don't overwork them number one that's what i've always thought even four days wasn't bad and everybody was compiling up complete games but it's just a shame warren that complete games are really de-emphasized i understand there's a lot of money invested into these players you worry about the tommy john surgery but still that's the one part of baseball that is sorely missed. We talk about things that have made it all right again. Right. The complete games I got a problem with. So right. with that said, okay, we have a couple people that are homers here. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and do, do a little bit of name dropping. All okay. Right. And the one that stands in my mind is a Yankee fan who's been taught to not wear any paraphernalia on here with it, but it doesn't stop his boss here from mentioning about whether or not Don Manning belo- Manningly belongs in the Hall of Fame. Uh, do you agree or disagree, Warren? Oh, I agree. I I, I definitely think Don Mattingly, you know, he did some things that uh, people didn't do. He hit more home runs. What, he had uh, five, uh, seven games in a row where he hit home runs, tied a major league record, you know, was arguably one of the greatest hitters to ever play the game, had a beautiful left-handed stroke. And that's one thing I've always wondered. Why do left-handed hitters have beautiful strokes as opposed to right-handed hitters? You know, you take a Tony Gwynn, a Rod Carew, a Don Mattingly. They, they're they beautiful swings as opposed to a right-hander. Just, uh, oh, good. Eric's got an answer? Uh, yeah, I got a, I've, I've got a, uh, I've got a theory. I was going to okay. wait until you were done. Right. Um, um, I think it's because left-handed hitters, they, they try and pull the ball more. They kind of go to their natural side mm-hmm. rather than trying to go, rather than trying to go oppo with it, which is like what a lot of right-handed hitters do. Right. Um, I think part of it is, is you find more left-handed pull hitters. I know, um, I know, you know, baseball, I've seen a number of them over the years, but they try left-handed hitters tend to go to their natural side more. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, that's why you see more of, um, more, more of a pretty swing, which mm-hmm. although, you know, I've seen, I've seen some hitters over the years with an ugly swing, but still yeah. ball, leaves, <laughs> ball, ball leaves yard. Yeah. And I, I don't think the fans or, or management is complaining. No, no. I saw in Chicago, Bill Buckner hit a ball one day that was in his eyes and he hit it that way. And not the, he hit it that way, like a tennis racket. I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes and the ball That's, stayed straight right down the right field line and hit the foul pole. That's that's another guy who should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was yeah. just about to say that. So you know what? Yeah. While you brought it up, let me go ahead and ask about Bill Buckner. Yeah, and I have another guy I want to address. You know what? To me, if it wasn't for that unfortunate defensive play right. that seems to haunt this guy, if you take his batting average and everything about his offense, there's this guy should be a lock in the no. Hall of Fame. He really should. Well, some thoughts on that. It, and what he did to play every day was just what he went through to play every day, an hour before the game, getting yeah. his ankles taped and ice down and heat and ice. And then after the game, again, another hour getting ice down and, and just every, he went through that every single day just to play. And it was amazing what he wow. went through. So we're in the, we're in the clubhouse after the game. I had a little weight routine that I did every day. So we used to talk to each other while we were, doing he was icing and i was doing my weight routine and it's the first of june and he says you know i don't have any home runs this season so i'm going to start tomorrow i'm going to start hitting home runs and then i was sitting there go okay good bill that's that sounds real good he had zero home runs first of june between june 1st and august 16th or 15th he hit 16 home runs august 15th his average went down and he's august 16th he goes i'm gonna quit hitting home runs he didn't hit another one the rest of the year he could do whatever (laughs) he wanted to do 
<laughs> with the bat. He was just it was amazing how he could put the bat on the ball. And the, the one thing that hurt him the most was he wasn't with O two three and O counts. He wasn't disciplined. He would pop balls up. They would in. And we, I was told, Ron Reed told me the first time I faced him, don't throw him a strike. He'll swing. He'll swing at something out of the strike zone. And that was his, because he could hit it. I mean, it was amazing what he could do with the bat. Kind of Unbelievable. Cool. And another should-be Hall of Famer is Mickey Lolich. I had the good pleasure right. of having him on a sports exchange. But if you ever talk a guy who obviously the 1968 World Series MVP on there, right. I don't think his record probably helps his cause any, but the fact that he had so many complete games and in innings eater, would you right. say, Warren, that Mickey Lolich belongs in the Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah, without question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the longevity and the, and the things that guys are getting in their eras – are you know don't have the statistics like a Mickey Lolich has, and, right. and some of the guys have in, in back in the fifties and sixties, and and the longevity they had, you know. Finally, they recognized Jim Cott. I was fortunate enough to play yeah. with Jim Cott for two years, and they finally recognized that you know not everybody plays twenty seven years. It's that's something yeah. special in itself. You know, to, regardless of what numbers he put up, to play that long, he had to be doing something right. All right, and another yeah. guy, when we talk about complete games, okay, who unfortunately passed away too early, it was Roy Halladay. Right. This guy here could have played in any era. Oh, yes. Agree right. Oh, I agree totally. Yeah, he, he reinvented himself. He had the worst year ever. Ever He had a 10-something ERA. It came back. They sent him all the way back to A-ball to get with the coach that he was familiar with. They restructured his whole, his arm angle and everything, which is very difficult to do. I, I mean, I heard him talking about changing your arm angle. Oh my God, that's you know, I, I thought about that. And I go, whoa, that's that's very very difficult to do, and then to come back and be at the top of your game and be the top pitcher for arguably for at least a five year period there. That was just he was phenomenal. You know, the things that he did were just phenomenal. Totally phenomenal, and he did, did it for nine innings every game. You could depend on him for nine innings and giving a bullpen a rest every fifth day. I mean, we can talk about pitching all day long, but with all due respect, you brought up Nolan Ryan, but Frank Tanana is another guy who did a wonderful job changing things up so that he had a formidable career as well. Any final thoughts on Frank Tanana, and then we'll wrap this bad boy right. up? Right, right, right. That was He was a guy that threw very hard when he first came up, right. and then – had arm problems and, and totally reinvented himself, you know, and it was, and had great success both ways as a power pitcher and as a finesse pitcher, you know, right. he was uh, another guy that just, he, he learned how to pitch. He, he you know, was, yeah. and I didn't mean to interrupt you, Warren, but no, yeah, no. I don't think the Tigers would have been the division winners without Frank Tanana in 1987. Right. What he did, what he right. did to that team and they right. beat out, they beat out Toronto. Remember at the, at the very end. Right. Mm -hmm. Frank is a great guy, still lives in the Detroit area, yeah. a member of the Polish Sports Hall of Fame, which I'm involved in. And uh, Frank Frank is a great guy. And you're right. He right. reinvented, reinvented right. himself. Right. Yeah, he's totally, you know, had a great career, just blew people away young and then had arm problems and then completely reinvented himself and, and was just as good, if not a better pitcher, when he learned how to pitch and uh, used what he had. And that's what you have to do. I, I had to do something similar to that when I hurt my shoulder was I'd lost three to five miles an hour on my fastball, but more than anything, I lost the movement. So I, instead of throwing sinkers, I threw more sliders and change-ups. I, mm. I learned a new pitch. I had to reinvent myself, and I would just use my fastball to move people off the plate with it and come back and throw sliders and change-ups to get people out with. All right, so I'm going to go around the horn one more time. Yes, in baseball, we can use that sort of terminology, okay? <laughs> well, I, hey, I, I'll take it. It is part of the sport. I just use it, and I'm glad I have a good crew here tonight so I can. And I also want to thank Willie Epping for his participation early in the show. I know the next time we bring him on in two weeks, he'll be able to say the entirety, but he got what he needed, in, and that's what I was happy about with Willie. All right, Eric, any last question for Warren? Yes. Well, with the bases being bigger, I'm sure I'm sure it would have I'm sure it helped having Bob Boone behind the dish. Um, yes. with, with, with um with the bases being bigger, do you think do you think Bob Boone would have been as great as as he as he was during your era? Oh sure, yeah, definitely, yeah. He was he was a great catcher. You know, he he really he really ran ran the show and and was it was somebody that you know he put his finger down and I just followed suit. Whatever you put down, I'm throwing. 
you know, so I knew he knew the hitters. He came out one night, we're in Pittsburgh, and Bill Robinson had played with the Phillies, and he knew Bill. And he came out, I had two strikes on me, he said, bounce a, curve, or bounce a slider right on top of home plate. He'll swing at it every time. I go, he goes back, I bounce a slider on home plate, and he swung a miss, strike three. You know, it was just little things like that where we talked about, you know, pitchers, uh, catchers coming out and, and having conferences with pitchers. It was just one thing he ran out, you know, told me, and turned around, ran back, and boom, and it, it, we were right back to work, you know, and it just, I threw the pitch and it was successful because he knew a little things he, every once in a while, he'd come up with little things that, that helped you get through. Okay. Jordan. Yeah, nothing. That's okay. <laughs> hey, listen, you asked some incredible questions earlier. That's okay. All right, George. Uh-huh. Well, uh, the, uh, one tiger that got away, Warren is a very important tiger. He's still with the organization now. But do you have any recollection of Lance Parrish? Lance Parrish, of course, left the Tigers, and it was very controversial because he took a lot of money to sign with the Phillies, and uh, and uh, right. the Tigers could never recover without after they lost Lance behind the dish. Right. Well, I was, I was, I guess, fortunate enough to play against the Tigers in instructional league in 1975 and 76. And those guys were all together. And that, that, oh, yeah. Trammell, Whitaker, Parrish, the whole crew were coming up together through the system. And we'd play against them in instructional league. They won year, I think they went 51 and nine. They just tore it up. I mean, they were just phenomenal talents. And that's what you want a guy like Lance Parrish, who's a durable, physical, big, physical guy that can play every day. You know, I, I would, when I played with Bob Boone, I played with Jody Davis in Chicago with the Cubs. And they were big, durable guys that caught every inning. You know, Jody Davis, when, when Steve Lake, our backup catcher, uh, contracted hepatitis, Jody Davis caught every inning for six weeks, but won. And he he caught every day, and he wanted to catch every day. I think it shortened his career, but uh, he he wanted to play every day. And those guys, uh, the durable catcher, you've got it. That that's what makes your team run. The catcher is is an outstanding position as far as they got to run the team. They see the every the field from every different perspective than the other eight players, and uh, they they're in charge and they they run the they run the defense. Well, good. Now, now I really got a powerful question. <laughs> when I played ball back in the day, little league, that is, I played catcher and I used to use every tactic on the planet <laughs> from barking in the umpire's ear to distract them. Okay, that was a lousy call. I could do better. <laughs> if that wasn't bad enough, I used to go ahead and ride the uh, hitter. I said, you know, I think he's going inside. I was disrupting <laughs> the situation. I got called for more catcher interference calls than anybody. I mean, so I guess where this is leading is why do catchers make the best managers? Well, just like I said, they see the game from a different perspective. They've seen it from the other way, from you know, from behind, and they do. They, you know, they've got to be able to run a pitching staff. And like I said before about Dallas Green, when he took over as manager, he he ran the pitching staff. He knew how to run and how to bring guys in in, in certain situations that most managers don't, unless they were a pitcher or a catcher. You know, and, and to me, one of Tony LaRusso's pitching coach was Dave Duncan, an old catcher, never yeah. pitched, an, uh, threw a pitch in his t- entire life, but had a great career as a pitching coach because he understood what it took to pitch, and he he had great success doing it. Oh, I used to drive my teammates crazy. I would go out there <laughs> and take the mound visits I needed. I once caught a foul ball with my mask on, and everybody was trying to tell me to go ahead <laughs> And take it off, and I never caught another foul ball after that. Because I, <laughs> like in my case, you know, I was able to keep my eye on the ball and then flip that yeah. stupid mask off, and all of a sudden I lost sight of it. So I said, you know what? I'm keeping the stupid helmet and mask on. I really didn't care. And if that wasn't bad enough, okay, I remember warming up my pitchers between innings, and I actually got the job one time when. Our two start, our two catchers didn't show up. My dad was managing the team, and you know, let's face it, I was a lousy position player anywhere else. So I'm raising my hand up as hard as he did, making sure my dad at the time could see it. Don't worry, he saw it. I mean, his kid is loud. He can't play any, and you know what? I got that position. I never let it go. And one of the two catchers quit, and I said, "Too bad, so sad." You show up. 
and otherwise you lose your job. And I had it, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> and I can tell you how many great interviews I've had with catchers through the years. When I bring you on one of these days, we, we, and you're, uh, Warren, I'd like you to come on more often if you want to. Oh, sure. Us. I'd be glad to. Yes, oh, don't worry. We have a lot of fun here. We can't <laughs> yeah. laugh. Yeah, this is great fun. I've been, really enjoyed myself. Thank you, Scott. Oh. Hey, we can't was, have fun here. You know what? I'll go with one of my old friends that I grew up in the business. We were in deep trouble. Yeah, and you know, that's the kind of thing you think you're going to go to sleep later, but you're not for two, three hours on the other side. But no, I mean, but no, I, I love bringing on new baseball analysts is really what I like to do. I had a good one last week uh -huh. with K.R. Lombardia, who saw it from a high school mm -hmm. standpoint. Having you the following week means I have a candid guy who didn't play in the majors. And now I got a new baseball analyst by the name of Warren Brewster. You ever heard of him? Yeah. Well, you're being nominated for the job by, uh, what am I, what am I, Eric? Oh, you're the, oh, oh, you're, oh, you're the dad of all this. Oh, okay. That's right. I'm the dad of this guy. So, so yeah, you definitely are. Willing. Yeah. I mean, you know, the main thing is Warren, I'd like you to come on from time to time here. Because we'll have sure. other different topics. Today was more of a reflection right. of your career in the 80s and Rose. But don't worry. Mm -hmm. With myself and this crew and everybody else, <laughs> I have no problem bringing you on as often as you want to come on. In fact, All right. I think Jordan and Eric and George would say, is it safe to give this guy an open invitation anytime he wants to come on? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I was, oh, I, thank I was you, guys. Good. I was good. At, well, I was, I was good. Majority, we have a unanimous decision, or a majority <laughs> doesn't mean everybody, but unanimous <laughs> is okay, so that's good to know. <laughs> All right, with that said, you uh -huh. know what? I want to let everybody know it's 108 inches uh -huh. baseball talk. My name is Scott Morgan, not the Motor City Madmouth, and don't you forget that more because I do have a little <laughs> nope, Michigan type of twang there. Okay, I'm glad we we're talking baseball uh -huh. with Mr. Warren uh -huh. Brewster, who's seen it all on many different levels. And my regular crew consists of Eric Katz, Jordan Long, George Eichhorn. And Willie Epting is going to be a part of our crew a couple times a month as well. So I think Willie will be happy to know that you're going to be on here more often. He'll be, and, he, and he does a lot with baseball. So any closing thoughts from the rest of you? No, I'd say no. this has been a, this is, this has been a, this has been a fun show, especially being, being able to talk to, uh, you know Warren Brewster, who played for um, obviously the Phil the Philly's first championship team, and hearing all sorts of stuff um, on that front, as well as hearing his opinions about today's game. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, with that said, why don't you go ahead and let everybody know how they get on, Eric? You can follow me on my Twitter at Sports Team News, or you can follow, or you can see my blog at BellyUpSports.com, where I talk all things baseball. Okay. What about you, Jordan? You can find me on Twitter at SportsScoop1. I have a blog that I write Mondays through Thursdays with podcasts on Fridays at sports-scoop.com. Also, you can find me here on 108 Stitches on Tuesday nights. And then Wednesdays, I am on the Pundits Pundit on the Sideline Sports Network. And you can find me on a bunch of their shows. All right. Now we have a new nickname to give George Ike, or now you see him, now you don't. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, um, that's okay. I'm just busting your chops. All right. I know. I know. Uh, anyway, Warren, yeah, it's good to have you. Good to be on with you. So, George, why don't Thank you, you. Let, you got some information? Why don't you go out there and yeah. flash that thing called a book? Yeah, yeah it's a book here book. that I wrote. Oh, look, look at Eric Katz. We got dual. <laughs> <laughs> Detroit sports broadcasters on the air. I know, uh, Warren, you remember uh, guys like yes. Bernie Harwell. Oh, George, yeah, definitely. Cal, yes. Paul mm -hmm. Carey, Ray Lane. Uh, right. well, I, put a, I put a book together with all their memories. And Scott, Scott's wow. in this book. Scott's yeah. been a partner of mine for 43 years in Detroit and uh, elsewhere. And so uh, the book's available at the uh, South Florida Tribune. I write under the Motor City Tribune website. And uh, we have a, a lot of fun on the different shows we're on together. You can reach me at GICorn at yahoo.com or on Twitter at SandGSports99. And uh, I'm on this show and other shows that Scott has on the network. I'm glad to be part. So, Warren, is there any way that people could get a hold of you or follow you anywhere? If I can be reached on in, at Gmail at Brewster, B-R-U-S-S-T-A-R, -S -S 40 at gmail.com. All right, well, so if you have any questions for Warren Brewster, now you have his email address. All right, let me go over some of our business here at the Trib. The audio version of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please hit the red subscribe button uh, south on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. Please also like, comment, 
share the broadcast, want to be a guest, no problem. All you need to do is send topic ideas to Tribune at gmail.com, or you can come in the chat room. We had a guy on earlier for Fire Up Michigan who did that, and guess what? He was invited, and, he, and this guy was awfully darn good, okay? <laughs> if you want to advertise cost-efficiently, call myself at 954-304-4941. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. You can also find me on Twitter at Tribune South. Our website is Tribune.com as well. Great job by Candy Evelyn, who does a masterful job making sure everything is rolling well. Without her, obviously, it would be difficult to get anything up there. And thankfully, all I get to do is talk while she's the brains of the organization. So what a great show tonight. Great first act, Warren. Thank you. you on for a long time. And now that we were able to get the technical side to work, at least you know how we can do it the next time. But right. it's been so great having you on, Warren. Thank and you. Everybody is better. Yeah. It's everybody's better is better because of you tonight. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. So this meanwhile, is- on behalf of Eric Katz, Jordan Long, George Eichhorn, and Warren Brewster, my name is Scott Morgan mm-hmm. Roth Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of 108 Sitches Baseball Talk. We'll have another episode next Tuesday night. Good night, everybody.